first thing I want to do today is um, start the process of assigning presentation topics for later in the term, right? So I've got three topics up here on the board. What I would like each of you to do is take out a piece of paper, write your student ID number, not your name, on top of it. Right, I don't want your name, I just want your ID number. And then I want you to list these three topics in order of preference, right? So the most interesting to you should be first, the least interesting to you should be last. And the reason I ask for your ID numbers and not your names is so that when I'm assigning the topics, it can be done blindly, right, without knowing who I'm assigning things to, but then, you know, I can identify you by that ID number once I've made the assignments. Now then, um, once you have made your choices, uh, before you pass them up, because we do have an odd number of people in the class, if you could indicate whether you prefer to work alone or in a group. And then once you've done that, go ahead and pass it up. Or actually, because we're too far apart to do that, I'll just come together. And I will shuffle these up so that I can't identify people by where they sit. Next time, we're going to be moving on to talking about women's issues in Victorian Britain. So um, all of these readings are from the section labeled the woman question in the textbook. Um, and these are going to lead us into reading a poem by Christina Rossetti next week called Goblin Market. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything regarding the class before we get into uh, Kipling and Imperial writing. No? Yes, yes. In general, assume that there's a response paper due unless I tell you otherwise. But yeah, I will usually remind you about that on Wednesdays. But yeah, unless I tell you otherwise, there will always be a response paper and a vocab quiz. We have one due by Friday, right? Yes. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, it says 
for Wednesday, are we still meeting Monday? Oh shit, you're right. Today is Wednesday. You know, I'm I'm sorry. I'm okay. I'm mixed up because I was laid up with vaccine sickness for the last 48 hours. So, and by the way, I still urge everybody to get vaccinated as quickly as you can. Right? I felt fine when I woke up this morning. I just felt like death yesterday. Right? And I felt pretty lousy the day before. Uh, my wife suffered. My wife suffered no side effects. So you know, sometimes. You, you get off scot-free. But yeah, you're right, yes, this is for Monday, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering why you were asking me about the response paper. And yeah, no, it's, yeah, okay. Yep, response paper due Friday. And vocab quiz due by Sunday. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's completely on me, just forgetting what day it is. That's all right. I just don't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you did, even if your classmates aren't necessarily. Okay, uh, any other questions about anything at all before we proceed? Okay, um, so let's start with the Kipling. How did this guys go? How did this go for you guys? What did you think of this? What's that? I said I liked it. Okay, what'd you like about it? Um, just the story about them taking over and training them. Okay. Like um, finally getting through. Like, even though when they didn't want to go at first, but like they settled down and like trained and then sent people everywhere. Okay, do you, think this, do you think the story thinks that Dan and Peachy are doing a good thing or are doing the right thing in going to Kafiristan and trying to take it over? Probably not. Okay, it's so probably not. <laughs> why, why not? It's kind of like built off the line, pretty much. Okay. Like what? Give me some examples here. Like what, what kind of lies are we talking about? Okay, yeah, so they're representing themselves as, or they, they, although they never actually say they're the sons of Alexander, right? The, they say the people come up with these stories about them, right? But they don't do anything to disabuse them of that notion. Well, let me put it to you another way. What do Dan and Peachy believe about the people of Kafiristan that is untrue or incorrect? They're becoming Englishmen. Does he think they're be do they think they're becoming English people? Is this, is English, is English something they need to be transfer, transformed into? Look on page 950, even before they go to Kafiristan, when they're looking through all the books in the narrator's um, office, right? Blow, Bellew, said Carnahan. Damn, they're an all-fired lot of heathens, but this book here says they think they're related to us English. And later on, Dan will insist on the Englishness of these people, right? So why does it matter that Dan and Peachy think that the people of Kafiristan are English or are related to the English? 
This is something we're going to try to pull out of this story as we examine some of the background material here, right? So one thing to note here before we get too deeply into the Kipling is that <clears throat> British rule in India was a pretty complex and often fragile kind of thing, right? There were essentially three different kinds of British colonies. The first were what were called crown colonies. Crown colonies were ruled directly from Great Britain. So, uh, say, Jamaica, for example, was a crown colony. Um, it was ruled by governors appointed by parliament um, <clears throat> who oversaw the colony, right? Um, there were also what were called protectorates. Now, protectorates had limited... self-government. And the British presence was technically only advisory. Uh, many of the African colonies, for example, um, that Britain settled in the latter part of the 19th century were protectorates rather than crown colonies, for example. Now, this doesn't mean that the British didn't basically call the shots in these places. But there was a thin veneer of self-government, right? Now, there were other protectorates, like Canada and Australia, that had almost total autonomy. Now, what makes places like Canada and Australia different from a place like Uganda, which was also a protectorate, but where Britain took a much heavier hand? What's different about the populations of these places? Small. Eh, roughly similar population size. Although Uganda's population is a little more concentrated. It's not as spread out. What's that? Yeah. In Canada and Australia, the indigenous population had been subdued and almost wiped out, right? So the majority of the the majority of the residents of these colonies were white. So they were given a lot more a lot more leeway to rule themselves than was the case in other similar protectorates. Now, India was a complicated case because, as we might recall from a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Romantic Orientalism, um, India was, up until 1857, ruled by a corporation. And the British East India Company's practices um, varied from region to region. And indeed, so there were some parts of India that were not ruled by the British at all. For example, there's a uh, um, a spot somewhere on the Indian subcontinent it's called Pondicherry, which I believe is still um, technically part of France, because the French never actually let it go. Um, and many of these central states on the Indian subcontinent uh, were actually ruled, at least in name, by native rajas, right, by native rulers. And these were often called native states. However, like, these, like many other protectorates, these, uh, r these local rajas were generally told what to do and what to say 
by British advisors, right, by British officials um, who came into the States um, <clears throat> in an advisory sort of capacity. So what did all of this look like in practice? Well, that was one of the reasons I wanted you to read those things for Monday, the Macaulay piece and the William Howard Russell piece and the T.N. Mukherjee piece, right? So we were look, try, trying to look at India through three different lenses there, right? One, Macaulay, right, through the lens of a thoroughgoing imperialist. Right, someone who is clearly 100% behind the imperialist project and is making arguments in favor of taking a heavier hand in India, at least in cultural matters. William Howard Russell, on the other hand, is at the very least sympathetic to native interests. So while he deplores the massacre that he's describing that occurred in 1857, he also understands the logic behind it, right? and understands that the rhetoric around it coming out of the British conceals more than it really reveals. And then the T.N. Mukherjee piece, right, from Mukherjee we have <clears throat> An Indian's observations on being a spectacle to white people in England, right? on being an object of curiosity. And that's one of the things that makes Kipling actually one of the most popular bright, uh, British writers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, right? So India has been part of the British Empire, arguably since the 17th century, but very few Britons knew anything about it, right? This is something that Mukherjee notes several times. If we turn to page, um, 702, the first paragraph of A Visit to Europe, um, he talks about um, the way he, what, he and the other Indians were watched and observed by British visitors to this colonial exhibition, right? The way they're going to put on display. We look about halfway down the paragraph. Human nature everywhere thirsts for novelty and measures out its favors in proportion to the rarity and oddity of a thing. It was from the ladies that we received the largest amount of patronage. We were pierced through and through by stares from eyes of all colors, green, gray, blue, and black, and every movement and act of ours, walking, sitting, eating, reading, received its full share of, oh, I never. The number of wives we left behind at home was also a constant theme of speculation among them, and shrewd guesses were sometimes made on this point, 250 being a favorite number. You could tell any amount of stories on this subject without exciting the slightest suspicion. Once, one of our number told a pretty waitress, I am awfully pleased with you and I want to marry you. Will you accept the 40th wife ship in my house, which became vacant just before I left my country? She asked, how many wives have you all together? 250, the usual number, was the ready answer. What became of your wife, number 40? I killed her because one morning she could not cook my porridge. The poor girl was horrified and exclaimed, Oh, you monster! Oh, you wretch! So, what two things is Mukherjee pointing out and playing with in this discussion of the usual number of wives?
What's that? Their preconceived notions. Okay, yeah. The, the, and are the preconceived notions that these British observers have about Indians based on reality? No. They've, they've developed all of these romantic fantasies, right, about the East. And they have all these assumptions about people from India. And then what does the little episode where the guy's talking to the waitress illustrate? What does it illustrate about the Indians themselves? What's the, so what's the question that the guy asks the waitress? likely is it that this guy actually has 250 wives? Yeah, he does not, right? So what is he doing to this waitress? Does he actually want to marry her? Yeah, he's just having some fun with her, right? So what's happening here is that he, what he's indicating here is that he and the other Indians know how they're perceived by the British, right? And they are using this for their own amusement to make these British observers a little bit uncomfortable, right? The way they're uncomfortable with being observed and pointed at, right? So <clears throat> Kipling becomes popular in large part because of this trend towards treating India and treating the East as spectacle, right? Now we've already seen um, India used for almost Gothic purposes, right, in the Robert, Robert Southey poem, The Jagannaut, right, and in the piece uh, by Letitia Elizabeth Lan uh, Lannan about widow burning, right, that romantic India was both a place of picturesque, romantic era India for the British was a place of both picturesque beauty and gothic horror, right? And that doesn't really change too much in the later 19th century. The big difference is that <clears throat> there's a much uh, stronger interest in sort of getting factual information about the place. In large part because getting factual information is a way of getting something under control, right? If you know a thing, you can control it. What is the narrator's office full of when Dan and Peachy come to visit him? What has he got all over the place? Maps. He's got books and maps, yes. And a map is a representation of a place, right? What do we usually find on a map? Yeah, it's you. Yeah, I mean, a, a map is essentially constructed to make it easy for you to find things, right? For easy for you to get where you're going, right? So you'll see things like you know boundaries, right? Roads and railroads. cities and towns, right? All conveniently placed on a kind of paper world, right? That lets you figure out where it is you need to go. So if you want to take over a place, right? One of the first things you need to do is understand the place, right? Now, what's interesting in particular about Kafiristan when they're looking for it on the maps? It's not on there. It's on there, right, but it's a blank, right? They know where it is. 
but very little is known about it, right? So Kafiristan, before we go any further, is a real place. Right, Kipling did not make this place up. And at least some of what he says about um, its location and its inhabitants is true, right? But Kafiristan is in what is now northeastern Afghanistan. So if these guys are starting out in northern India, Kafiristan would be several weeks' journey through much of Pakistan, through just about all of Afghanistan, Afghanistan right? Um, <clears throat> you know, they go first by camel, then by mule. And then when they get into Afghanistan, they have to go through the mountains. Um, so it's a difficult and lengthy journey. But Kafiristan is known to be incredibly hostile to outsiders. especially missionaries. But Christian and Muslim missionaries were notably unwelcome in Kafiristan, which had its own native religion that seems to, to have been similar in some ways uh, to an early form of Hinduism. So Kafiristan is notably hostile to outsiders. Um, and... What else was, I, what was the other point I was going to make about this? So it's hostile to outsiders. It's difficult to reach. And it is outside what was then the current sphere of British influence. So what Dan and Peachy are trying to do is get out of British India and build themselves a kingdom independently somewhere else, right? Now, there was actually historical precedent for this sort of thing. Um, there's a guy by the name of James Brooke. And I'm just trying to remind myself of the dates here. Now, James Brooke became the Raja of a kingdom in Indonesia called Sarawak. First, by helping the guy who was the native Raja. I believe he helped him put down a revolt or something. And then by undermining him and taking power himself, which he then passed on to his descendants. So the Brooks became the so-called white Rajas of Sarawak. Sarawak. And this would have happened in the 1860s. So about a generation before um, the events in The Man Who Would Be King, right? This story is written in 1888. But what's interesting about James Brooke is that after he becomes Raja of his own independent kingdom, he bends the knee to Queen Victoria and is named Sir James Brooke. So here we had a guy who had um, built his own independent kingdom, who nonetheless decides to submit to British imperial authority 
in exchange for a knighthood, right? Now, if we're looking at the way rank works in an aristocratic society, who ranks higher, a king or a knight? Yeah, absolutely a king, right? I mean, even if you're just looking at like the game of chess, right? What's the piece you have to protect? Yeah, you gotta protect the king, right? You don't have to protect the knight, right? The knights are, you know, almost like sacrificial pieces, right? So, <clears throat> we can see something like this happening in Dan's imagination. as their takeover of Kafiristan proceeds and grows, right? If we look on page 960, the long paragraph at the bottom of the page. I won't make a nation, says he. I'll make an empire. These men aren't N-words, they're English. And by the way, um, in British parlance, the N-word is generally used to refer to, not specifically to people of African descent, but people who, just basically anyone who's not white. Look at their eyes, look at their mouths, look at the way they stand up. They sit on chairs in their own houses. They're the lost tribes or something like it, and they've grown to be English. I'll take a census in the spring if the priests don't get frightened. There must be a fair two million of them in these hills. The villages are full of little children. Two million people, 250,000 fighting men, and all English. They only want the rifles and a little, a little drilling. 250,000 men ready to cut in on Russia's right flank when she tries for India. Peachy man, he says, chewing his beer in great hunks. We shall be emperors, emperors of the earth. Raja Brook will be a suckling to us. I'll treat with the viceroy on equal terms. I'll ask him to send me 12 picked English that I know of to help us govern a bit. There's Macrae, there's McRae, Sergeant Pensioner at Sigoli. Many's the good dinner he's given me, his wife, a pair of trousers. There's Donald in the warder of Tungu Jail. There's hundreds that I could lay my hands on if I was in India. The Viceroy shall do it for me. I'll send a man through in the spring for those men, and I'll write for a dispensation from the Grand Lodge for what I've done as Grand Master. That, and all the Snyders that'll be thrown out when the native troops in India take up the martini. They'll be worn smooth, but they'll do for fighting in these hills. Twelve English, a hundred thousand Snyders run through the Emir's country in driblets. I'd be content with twenty thousand in one year, and we'd be an empire. When everything was ship shape, I'd hand over the crown, this crown I'm wearing now, to Queen Victoria on my knees, and she'd say, Rise up, Sir Daniel Dravet. Oh, it's big, it's big, I tell you, but there's so much to be done in every place, Bashkai, Kawak, Shu, and everywhere else. So <clears throat> Let's try to pick apart Dan's line of thinking here, right? First off, what is he insisting on at the beginning here? Yeah, okay, he's talking about making an empire, right? But what is he insisting on about the Kafiris? Yeah, that they are English, right? That they're already English. Somehow, you know, up here in these mountains, they've grown to be English, right? They look like the English... They sit on chairs like English people, right? They behave like the English, right? And then what does he, what does he plan to do next? Right after he says he's sure that these people are English, he wants to take a census, yes. Now, what's the goal of a census. What are you doing when you take a census? Um, yeah, you're counting population, right? So again, right, one of the ways that you control the place is by knowing facts about the place, right? Nobody's ever bothered to count the number of people who live in Kafiristan, in part simply because of geographical difficulty and in part because they have a tendency to shoot out to shoot outsiders, right? But yeah, so in order to better control and rule his kingdom, right, he wants to know how many people are there 
so that he knows how many resources he needs, right? And what kinds of resources does he seem to be most focused on in his ramblings here? Weapons, exactly, yeah. He's trying to figure out how many weapons he needs, right, to turn these people into a real army. So that they can threaten Russia when Russia tries to play for, make a play for India, right? So even as he's thinking about building his own empire, he's looking at protecting British interests from their foreign rivals, right? One of the things he's looking to do by building up his kingdom in Afghanistan is make it more difficult for the Russians to threaten British interests. And then what does he plan to do when, as he says, he's got everything ship shape? They'll give it to the queen. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Like, on the one hand, he's comparing himself to Raja Brook, right? And saying, you know, Raja Brook will be a suckling compared to us. But he also wants to do the same thing that Raja Brook did, right? Once he's got everything in order, he's going to make Kafiristan part of the larger British sphere of influence. and subordinate himself to the queen, right? So what do you think is going on? Why do you think Dan's plan is not to keep this for himself, but to give it to the queen? What's that? Like, say, like, when he goes back home, might be more respected. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably actually a big part of it, right? What are Dan and Peachy before they go to Kafiristan? Colonists. What's that? Colonists. Basically, yeah. They belong to a class of people that Kipling refers to as loafers. Right? He uses this word kind of a lot, right? And were all of you able to um, ascertain what exactly a loafer is? Okay, so most writing about India, or at least about the British in India in this period, was primarily concerned with the upper classes of civil servants and business people, right? You know, describing what life was like in, um, you know, the kinds of the, the hill stations where these people, you know, hung out and had their little cocktail parties and things like that, right? Kipling is less interested in those people and is more interested um, in working class Europeans who end up in India for various reasons, right? So loafers belong to this later class. And loafers are people of no fixed profession. Or residents. And they wander throughout India, which remember at this time would have also included uh, what is now Pakistan and what is now my, uh, Myanmar. And they either work at odd jobs or at petty crime of various sorts. Right? For example, what are Dan and Peachy planning to do at the beginning of the story? Before the narrator betrays them. Um, 
Well, there. So the uh, Peachy wants the narrator to deliver a message. The Peachy meets the narrator in a train car, right? Wants him to deliver a message for uh, for Dan, uh, <clears throat> who is coming in another train. And why is it that Peachy wants to meet up with Dan? What are they going to do? Well, that's one thing that Peachy suggests that he and the narrator could do if they need money, right? We can threaten a station master. But his plan with Dan, right, the thing that they want to do is impersonate a British journalist, right? Pretend to be correspondents for a paper called The Backwoodsman, which is a fictionalized version of the paper Kipling actually worked for. Um, and threaten to reveal certain secrets about the Raja of Dagumba, right, in order to shake money out of him. So, yeah, so they do work confidence games of various kinds in addition to doing various kinds of honest labor, right? The, one, the thing that makes somebody a loafer, though, is that they're people of relatively low social status, but of European descent, who are wandering about India with nothing in particular to do, right? So that's what Dan and Peachy are at the beginning of the story. And so, yeah, I think that there is something to the idea that what they want is respect from other Europeans. And one way to get that is to forge their own little kingdom out here and then to give it to Queen Victoria, right? So because, because rank within that British hierarchy seems to them more important than building their own independent power, right? Now, what brings it all tumbling down for Dan? What's that? The Yeah. Now, what are the two things that Dan and Peachy swear off in their contract? Liquor and girls. Yeah. And I guess tobacco. I, put, I said tobacco, too, because he said... Yeah, although that's not actually in their contract, right? Yeah. We look at the contract on page 950. Women What's that? Yeah, it's just, yeah, women and alcohol are what they swear off, right? This contract between me and you, pursuing, witnesseth in the name of God, amen, and so forth. One, that me and you will settle this matter together, i.e., to be kings of Kafiristan. Two, that you and me will not, while this matter is being settled, look at any liquor nor any women, black, white, or brown, so as to get mixed up with one or the other harmful. Three, that we conduct ourselves with dignity and discretion, and if one of us gets into trouble, the other will stay by him. Signed by you and me this day, P.G. Taliaferro, Carnahan, Daniel Dravet, both gentlemen at large. So, <clears throat> they both, they swear off women, they swear off alcohol, and they stick to this almost up until the end, right? And then Dan insists that he wants a wife. Now, what makes this problematic, apart from the fact that he's breaking the contract? Was that she, I mean, she would have to have a little bit of power, like if he was to leave, or no? Well, why are all the women afraid to marry Dan? We look on page 962, near the bottom of the page. A god can do anything, says I. If the king is fond of a girl, he'll not let her die. She'll have to, said Billy Fish. There are all sorts of gods and devils in these mountains, and now and again a girl marries one of them and isn't seen anymore. Besides, you two know the mark cut in the stone. Only the gods know that. We thought you were men until you showed the sign of the master. 
So what is the girl afraid of? What does she think is, what, what, do the, what do all the girls think will happen if they marry Dan? Because they think he's a god. Yeah. That what Dan and Peachy don't understand is that the, these people actually have a tradition, right? Where girls in the villages are married to a god or a devil in the mountains, right? And then they go away and they're never seen again. So because they don't understand local tradition, right? Because they keep insisting that these people are English like them, and they make no real effort to understand their actual context, right? They make these kinds of mistakes, right? So the girl is afraid to marry Dan because she thinks she's going to die. Because that's what happens to girls who marry gods within this particular culture. They die. Or at the very least, they disappear and are never seen again. And Dan refuses to accept or understand this, right? So how does this end up getting resolved? What does the girl do to Dan? Uh, yeah, Dan, is, well, and actually, that, that points to another issue. Uh, there are some apparent inconsistencies in Peachy's story, right? You know, where Dan is executed once he's captured by being placed on one of the rope bridges and having the ropes cut, right? So he then drops down to the chasm. And if that's what happened to him, then how did Peachy get his head, right? And Peachy... Uh, supposedly is crucified and survives. And he does have the marks on his hands that indicate that this happened, right? But that happens a little later, right? The girl causes the trouble that leads to their deaths, though, right? If we look on page 963. Yeah, she bites him, right? Yeah, she can't... Yeah. She shuts her eyes, gives a bit of a squeak, and down goes her face in the side of Dan's flaming red beard. The slut's bitten me, says he, clapping his hand to his neck, and sure enough, his hand was red with blood. Now, what does this prove to the people? Well, what, what did they think he was? They thought he was a god, right? What don't gods do? They don't bleed, yeah. If he is a god, he shouldn't have bled when she bit him. Now, do we think that the girl came to this conclusion on her own, that she decided to bite him on her own, or does it look like she might have been put up to this? If we look slightly above where she bites Dan, right on page 963, up comes the girl, and a strapping wench she was, covered with silver and turquoises, but white as death, and looking back every minute at the priests. She'll do, said Dan, looking her over. What's to be afraid of, lass? Come and kiss me. And that's when she bites him, right? So the whole time before she bites him, she keeps looking back at the priests, right? Who have, who have been in the tent with her, preparing her. So it seems like it's probably their idea to test whether or not Dan is a god, right? It's like, okay, bite him and see what happens, right? If he bleeds, we know he's not a god. And because he bleeds, the people rebel against him, right? And they lose control of the whole situation. And I think the basic point here, again, is Dan's insistence, the Dan's insistence on the Englishness of the Kafiris 
And his insistence on Englishness is normalcy, right? That this is just kind of like the default norm for humanity. Um, lead him to misjudge the people around him, right? He misjudges their specific loyalty to him. He misjudges their loyalty to the ideals he claims to serve. And he misjudges their attachment to their own religious beliefs. And in fact, a lot of Kipling's stories uh, feature missionaries who end up getting tricked or outsmarted uh, by Hindu or Muslim priests because the missionaries don't understand local contexts, right? And so um, <clears throat> aren't able to compete with native religions effectively. But yeah, let's get back for a second to that issue of um, Dan and Peachy's, uh, of Dan's death in particular, right? And I think one of the things that makes all this a little bit iffy is Peachy, the state that Peachy's in when he's telling this story. Do you notice anything weird about the way he narrates the story to the, uh, to the journalist? What does Peachy keep doing in reference to himself? as he's telling the story. How does he keep referring to himself? Sometimes I, but sometimes he seems to dissociate and start referring to himself in the third person, right? So Peachy is showing some signs of schizophrenia in his narration and is perhaps an unreliable storyteller here, right? We only have his word to go on. But it's clear that he keeps dissociating from himself. Even when, like, particularly when he's narrating Dan's death and his torture. If you look on page 965, what was you pleased to say, Wine Carnahan? They took him without any sound. Not a little whisper all along the snow. Not though the king knocked down the first man that set hand on him. Not though old Peachy fired his last cartridge into the brown of him. Not a single solitary sound did those swines make. They just closed up tight, and I tell you, their fur stunk. There was a man called Billy Fish, a good friend of us all, and they cut his throat, sir, then and there like a pig. And the king kips, kicks up the bloody snow and says, We've had a dash of fine run for our money. What's coming next? But Peachy, Peachy tell you fair, I tell you, sir, in confidence, as betwixt two friends, he lost his head, sir. No, we didn't either. The king lost his head, so he did, all along of one of those cunning rope bridges. Kindly let me have the paper cutter, sir. It tilted this way. They marched him a mile across that snow to a rope bridge over a ravine with a river at the bottom. You may have seen such. They prodded him behind like an ox. Damn your eyes, said the king. Do you suppose I can't die like a gentleman? He turns to Peachy, Peachy that was crying like a child. I've brought you to this, Peachy, says he. Brought you out of your happy life to be killed in Kafiristan, where you was late commander-in-chief of the emperor's forces. Say you forgive me, Peachy. I do, says Peachy. Fully and freely do I forgive you, Dan. Shake hands, Peachy, says he. I'm going now. Out he goes, looking neither right nor left. And when he was plumb in the middle of those dizzy dancing ropes, cut, you beggars, he shouts. And they cut. And old Dan fell, turning round and round for 20,000 miles. For he took half an hour to fall till he struck the water. And I could see his body caught on a rock with the gold crown close beside. So again, this reintroduces that problem, right? You know, if, 
Dan fell that far into a chasm. How did they retrieve the head, right? So this makes Peachy's story, at least in this sense, doubtful, right? That at the very least, his account of Dan's death, which also seems to be a moment in which he dissociates, right? Where he keeps referring to himself in the third person. Right, this becomes uh, problematic here. But do you know what they did to Peachy between the two pine trees? They crucified him, sir, as Peachy's hand will show. They used wooden pegs for his hands and his feet, and he didn't die. He hung there and screamed, and they took him down next day and said it was a miracle that he wasn't dead. They took him down, poor old Peachy that hadn't done them any harm, that hadn't done them any. He rocked to and fro and wept bitterly, wiping his eyes with the back of his scarred hands and moaning like a child for some ten minutes. So... I think that the basic thrust of all of this, right, is that Peachy is telling his story to a journalist, right? The guy he's talking to is the editor of a newspaper. And if we tie this back to the T.N. Mukherjee piece that I asked you to read from Monday, right? Let's just even think back to what Mukherjee said about people's speculations about his number of wives, right? What does that suggest the British public was most interested in hearing or in learning about India? What does it suggest their, about their perceptions of, of, of India and of Central Asia? Archaic. Yeah, that it's archaic and barbaric, right? And the kind of and the story that Peachy tells reinforces that idea, right? that Kafiristan, in particular, is technologically backward, and the people have no sense of loyalty, right? Um, and they'll kill you as soon as look at you. And you know, they hate outsiders, and um, you know, they're, they're violent. And they have this strange, archaic religion that is similar in some ways to Freemasonry. But the fact that Peachy is clearly an unreliable narrator, undermines the story that he tells, right? So, perhaps the percept, the interest that many British readers and British you know, consumers of newspapers, things like that, perhaps the interest that they show in India, the stuff they think, the stuff that the public wants from India is based on false perceptions that come from unreliable reporters. And that's where we're going to finish up because we are about out of time. Does anybody have any questions about anything? So for next time we're moving on from issues of imperialism um, to women's issues. So read those uh, bits in the uh, woman question section for next time and make sure to get the response paper done on Friday.